Excellent. Welcome to the Metasploit team demo meeting. This is our first team demo meeting for 2020, which is very exciting. The year is off to a good start. Uh, we've got a, quite a bit of stuff to cover today, this being our first meeting of 2020, so let's hop in. So we do have some new modules. Uh, there was some recent news around a directory traversal vulnerability affecting some Citrix Netscaler application delivery controllers. For vulnerable targets, a directory traversal can be exploited to achieve unauthenticated command execution on the target, which makes things interesting. Community contributor Eric Winter provided a scanner for detecting vulnerable targets, and community contributor Mechala added a module for exploiting the vulnerable vulnerability on such targets. It's really neat stuff. Community contributor SEC ENV provided a module targeting vulnerable D-Link Soho router devices, exploiting a weakness in the universal plug and play API to gain unauthenticated root level command and code execution on a vulnerable target. It's very cool. I believe we'll have a demo of this. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And community contributor Jacob Baines added a new module targeting a vulnerability in uh, this present some projection devices made by a company called We Present allowing exploit via API URL request to gain unauthenticated command execution on the target. It should be noted that we present has OEM agreements with many other companies. So some projector devices branded as Sharp, Crestron, InFocus, Xtron, and many more do contain this vulnerability. And some more new modules. Community contributor B. Coles added not one, not two, but three new modules for attaining privilege escalation. That's awesome. The first module targets vulnerable Plantronics Hub Windows applications where the automatic update service called Spokes Update Service can be used to execute, as a system user, a file writable by any user. I like that. This has been tested work on 64-bit Windows 7 and Windows 10 targets, and I believe we'll have a demo of this as well. The second module targets Linux 4.4.0 and 4.8.0 kernels in Ubuntu and Ubuntu-derived distros of using a null pointer dereference in the reliable datagram sockets kernel code to gain privilege ex escalation. Very nice. The third module targets open BSD systems that have a vulnerable LDSO dynamic loader, which can be cajoled into not resetting the LD library path environment variable, allowing for a path, pun intended, to privileged code execution. Pretty snazzy. Contributor rootup added a new module, which exploits a directory traversal vulnerability present in some network surveillance management software made by TVT, allowing retrieval of file contents. And not blind to our own vulnerabilities, contributor DeepSight added a denial of service module for targeting a regex parsing weakness in reverse HTTP and reverse HTTPS payload handlers present in Metasploit framework version 5.0.27 and below. As always, we appreciate the responsible disclosure. and a lot of other valuable work going on. Community contributor Nicholas Stark added support for the prepend set UID and prepend set RES UID payload options on the REMLE architecture. And contributor ZeroSum improved the BlueKeep exploit module by sending periodic mouse movement keep alive messages during exploitation to allow the exploit to succeed if the time to transfer the heap groom packets exceeds 30 seconds, which it can do that over the internet or on a slow network. That's very cool. Contributor Fra added support for macOS and the web delivery module. Good stuff there. Uh, our own Christophe De La Fuente improved version checking logic in the framework library code uh, for WordPress and also fixed some broken spec tests in the process. Yeah, I gotta like the working spec test. Community contributor B. Coles improved the Linux BPF Privesque module to act more accurately target vulnerable kernel versions, as well as warning the user that manual cleanup of the added cron job is necessary post exploitation. Appreciate that. And community contributor Hoodie added re exploitation notes to the RDS, RDS page copy user Privesque module documentation. I like keeping those module documentations up to date. It's good stuff. Community contributor L codes updated print payload generate to add a new line when printing raw payload to the console, which avoids corrupting the command prompt afterward. That's a nice, nice thing to have. Our own Jeffrey Martin updated the OpenVAS data importer to work with the new 7.0 XML format. Good stuff there. And our own WVU added a check to the Webmin backdoor module, uh, whether the server responded with SSL enabled while the module uh, had it disabled. Community contributor L codes updated job descriptions for UDP handlers. So they now show a URI with protocol host and port, similar to what TCP handlers show. 
and community contributor Beacoles added a command stager for binary payloads that utilizes the LWP request -m get command to fetch a payload over HTTP. HTTP, there's two Ts. Appreciate that. <laughs> uh, let's see, a few, some more enhancements. Community contributor Hoodie added the ability for Hashcat to take advantage of kernel optimization, which can decrease cracking times by half or better. Super cool. Our own Brent Cook updated the Sun RPC port mapper scanner module with a protocol option to select between TCP or UDP. Community contributor B. Coles added the attributes method to the MSF host file mixin, allowing module developers to list Linux file attributes for a given file, and also added an immutable method to check if a file is immutable. I like that. B. Coles also updated MSF host files write file Unix shell method to randomize the test string. Good stuff. And some bug fixes. Love the bug fixes. Uh, our own Dean Welch added support for custom HTTP cookies in reverse HTTP, HTTPS Windows payloads, which fixed an outstanding issue. Community contributor L codes fixed bind payloads for Windows and Nix using the Lewis scripting language to no longer reference an undefined variable. I appreciate that. And community contributor B calls fixed an exception on connection failure in the EFS FMWS user ID buffer overflow exploit module. Community contributor Fra offered a fix for ignoring the SSL certificate and the Python code within the web delivery module. And our own WVU updated the new Citrix uh, directory traversal scanner module and the Pulse secure file disclosure aux, module, aux gather module to use send request CGI instead of send request raw. So all that's good stuff there. And a few more bug fixes. Community contributor Hoodie fixed a regex parsing bug in the Telnet login module when parsing Telnet banners upon successful login, like that. Our own Brent Cook added a fix for the ran text library logic to take a range while debugging. And for details on recent framework activity, you can always check out the weekly Metasploit wrap up blog post at blog.rapid7.com. And as always, a huge thanks to all that helped make Metasploit better through their contributions and time. Thank you. Now let's get to the good stuff. Demos. All right. See, Spencer's got a demo for the Plantronics stuff here. You ready for me to start up that video, Spencer? Yeah, that's right. Let's do it. All right. Yep. So first off, we're just showing that we're uh, running this session on a Windows 10 system, 64-bit. Of course, Git system is not working for us. So that's where our handy new local privilege escalation vulnerability comes into play. Uh, so we're taking a look at the options. Um, there's not too many here, um, which is pretty convenient, makes it nice and easy to use. Uh, but what we're going to go ahead and do is use the module to run the check method. It's going to identify if the service is running. Um, unfortunately, we can't like actually validate vulnerability to it through the check method, uh, but we can still go ahead and exploit it. And so what we go ahead and do is drop a file and we overwrite uh, the entry within that configuration file that the Plantronics update service uses and ultimately use that to execute our payload as NT authority system. Super cool. That does look really easy to use. Nice. Any questions uh, for Spencer? All right. Thanks, Spencer. Thanks, everyone. Well, let's see here. How about a demo of the D-Link Soho unauthenticated RCE from our own Shelby Pace? Uh, this is a vulnerability for um, a bunch of D-Link routers, actually. Uh, and right now, I am emulating this device uh, with Fermadyne. Uh, it's being a little slow, but here's the actual web page for it. Um, so it looks like, by default, these uh, routers, including the D-Link uh, DIR 859, come with this UPnP service uh, enabled by default. And um, during the subscription phase, of, um, I guess, subscribing some new device uh, to, to monitor. Uh, basically, uh, you end up passing, um, you can pass um, just random code in because uh, the actual variable is uh, unsanitized. So I already have all of the parameters filled in. So um, just like that, you get a shell uh, as root. Uh, yeah, uh, any questions? Going once, 
that's that's a looks really easy to use yeah. for, for a vulnerable <laughs> target. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Fermidine sounds interesting. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, yeah. It was actually really, really easy to set up too. Super cool. Thank you, Shelby. Yeah. Uh, so we have a demo here of let's see, I've lost my notes. There they are. Uh, for Brendan, for a recently landed PR, uh, which supports uh, PPID spoofing, and you can find this code in the current framework uh, master. It'll get picked up in the weekly framework release uh, this coming Thursday. And Brendan, you ready for me to, to try running the video? Sure. Cool. Does PPID stand for parent process ID? Yes, it does. All right. Why, uh, why would I, why would I want to spoof a parent process ID? Uh, to make it look like you were spawned by a trusted process. Oh, cool. So that kind of breaks your IOC checkers? Uh, certainly, if somebody's looking, it seems less suspicious uh, for uh, the process to be launched by a you know, trusted process. Uh, feel free to kick it off. All right. So the way that this works is that there's an extended <clears throat> in a process startup uh, structure that uh, is available in Windows, and you can edit it. Uh, in this particular case, we've got a shell just of a regular user that's on here. You've got to be careful on what you pick as the parent process that you'd like to use. It needs to have the same permissions uh, that the process doing the injecting does. In this case, I'm grabbing a service host that's running as a local user. Um, and so the other thing to be careful of is some, we came to the conclusion that some compilation procedures uh, have some protections that prevent this from happening. So definitely check if you can do this with one of the processes before you do it, say, live. Um, so as you can see, the payload inject we've had for a long time. We just added this PPID that you can set. Uh, and so we're going to grab 2728, which is that service host running as a local user. And I screw up my verbiage. So to make everybody feel better. And so what this is going to do is because we haven't given a uh, process to inject to, we're going to spawn our own process. And when we spawn that our own process, we're going to give it the parent uh, PID of the service host. In this case, it'll be a, a notepad process that we launch and inject into. And so there we go. We have our interpreter session. This info, we're still running on Windows 10 x64 build 17134. Uh, our PID is 3652. So let's check that out. And 3652 should be the notepad process. And the parent process of that notepad process is listed as our service host running as the local user. Cool. Any questions? Does this require escalated privileges on the root interpreter session to modify the process table, or is like everyone allowed to do that? Uh, so you can do that. So from my experiments, you can do this to any process that's running with the same permissions that you have. In that particular case, we were running as just a regular old user. Mm -hmm. um, and so since that user had a service host running, I could go ahead and spoof it. If you have system level privileges, you can do this to more important processes. Uh, okay. But, was, go ahead. I was thinking in terms of like, um, if we were to make this like a prepend um, piece of code that could run inside of shell code, um, like for instance, if we were to run like a kernel level exploit, oftentimes those run as a child process of like the print spooler. Um, and that's like, you know, it kind of sticks out like a sore thumb, but um, would a process be able to reparent itself so that it could look like it's actually attached to something more benign or, or less, less likely to get caught or immediately um, from that point of view? I don't know. In that particular case where the, the structure we're editing is the startup info block. Uh -huh. uh, 
So I don't know if you can do that on the fly. You probably can if you have system level privileges. Uh, I'd have to look into it though. Interesting, okay, thanks. Uh, one thing I did wanna point out real quick is Fra, the person that wrote this, was super awesome and implemented this inside the process library. So we're not limiting ourselves to just this module. This module is the first one to implement the ability that it's in the process library. We can actually pretty easily import this to other things too. Oh, that's super cool. Very nice. And anything else, any other questions going once? Awesome. Thank you, Brenda. Excellent.